Mill Surf Garage back with the Remington Model 24 brought to you by who else? John Browning. Boom! John Browning, he's looking at you. Yes, this is a John Browning design. You know, John Browning's my favorite. This, in my opinion, is the best semi-automatic 22 ever made. There you go. It's out there. I said it. And they made a lot of incarnations of this thing all the way up through till today. I'm pretty sure they still are making this thing. Um, all the way back from 1912, when Browning started tinkering around to make it, all the way till now. So well over 100 years of uh, this thing on the market I am definitely not alone in uh, making it my favorite. But this arc incarnation, the 24, my favorite. Later on, the uh, Auto 22 is what it was called. Um, I like them, but there's just something about this one, just the shape of it, size of it, feel of it, weight of it. It's just, just absolutely perfect. Let's uh, get into a little bit of history, where this thing fits into the place of things, a little bit of how this was made, when, why, what was going on. And then, uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the ergonomics here. So, where we left off last time with Browning was he uh, brought a semi-auto shotgun design to Winchester. Uh, like he was bringing all his rifles there. And uh, he wanted to work out a little bit of a different deal this time because the semi-auto shotgun thing, nobody could really seem to iron that out. Browning had something special there that nobody else could really tackle. And uh, he wanted to work out a little bit of a better deal for himself, kind of like he was getting with uh, FN uh, for Beak National in Belgium. He was selling some handgun designs and other things to them, and they they had kind of like a different uh, arrangement, which was like a royalty arrangement, and he wanted to work that out with Winchester. They flatly refused. So he tried to take this thing across the street, not this thing, but the semi-auto shotgun design. He tried to take that across the street to Remington. Uh, supposedly the head of Remington had a heart attack and died that day. So uh, kind of went back to his uh, little office there and figured out what to do and just decided to take that design over the ocean to Belgium as well. So um, that's what he did. And then we're going to skip a little bit. There's going to be a little bit of a you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, dissolve to now because we're going to skip over some of the things he did between that period and uh, here. But after finalizing things with that semi auto shotgun design and dabbling around with some other center fire uh, rifles, semi auto rifles that he was making in Belgium and then dealing with Winchester, I mean, with uh, Remington, and Remington was making the uh, that auto shotgun. He brought he so he had you know contracted Remington to make it here in the states. So he decided I'm going to sit down and I'm going to make a semi-auto 22 to compete with the uh, Winchester 1903, which was doing very well at the time. Even though it was using a proprietary cartridge, he probably realized I don't have to use any proprietary cartridge. Smokeless uh, 22 ammo had been out for a while. So uh, he's like, I'm going to make a rifle that's just uh, needs smokeless. No black powder it could be cycled through here. Well, you could, but it would gum it up and it probably wouldn't cycle right. But uh, he made it, um, he made some that were short only and some that were long rifle only. No longs and you couldn't interchange. You either had to buy a rifle that was made for shorts or a rifle that was made for lo long rifle. So uh, this is a long rifle uh, version. He um, started... Uh, work on this thing in 1912 had all the patents finalized by 1914 and production started in belgium but then bang uh world war one and that really messed him up because he was having these things made in belgium he was having them brought back to the united states and he was selling them exclusively through his browning store in ogden utah and he probably had dreams of eventually competing with Winchester, you know what I mean, in, uh, in Remington, because he's, if he's going to sell it exclusively out of his place, I mean, forget it, if if war didn't hit, uh, who knows what would have happened with that uh, 
You know, the whole buying a Browning rifle thing might have been something all completely different. It might have been, uh, you know, so many other designs that we would call Winchester designs or, I mean, well, Winchester or Remington designs or whoever else might have actually been, uh, you know, made exclusively uh, for him or he could have uh, developed his own manufacturing place. Who knows? But World War One happened and just put this whole idea of his to sell this thing out of Ogden, Utah on hold. Um, and then World War War for a few years. And then when, when that was all over, um, you know, Browning had, he sure was busy during that period, but it wasn't for making, uh, you know, private guns for private sale and everything like that. It was definitely encompassed a bunch of years for everybody with dealing with World War I. And when we moved back into civilian arms manufacturing, uh, in 1922, Remington started making this thing as the Remington Model 24. And, of course, with the plus two thing, if you know what that is, they, Remington, with they, if they started making a rifle in 1922, what was it? The Model 24. Two years was added to everything. So, um, the differences between this and the Belgian one were the sights and where the loading port was. and But, but basically, it was the same rifle, you know. And, uh, you know, older Belgian... Um, examples exist, and uh, I think they're big money. They're kind of rare, but uh, I've seen them, and I just kind of like this configuration of loading and the site, uh, you know, anyway. But I think some of the ones in Belgium were made very ornate and very beautiful, so not only are they rare, but they're like works of art. Some of them, I've, I've seen them, they're crazy. That's uh, serious gun collectors move into that realm. But, uh, so he started selling these, uh, Remington started selling these for about the same price as the uh, Winchester 1903, which at the time was kind of expensive. It was more than the Model 12, the Remington Model 12, more money than the Winchester Model 61. They were, um, they were competing directly with the Winchester 1903 at that point. So let's see, get some numbers here. Let's throw some numbers at you so we can just get this all out of the way. And then we can just look at how this thing kind of works. Very simple um, functioning. Uh, they sold 131,000 of these as the Model 24, 132,000 of them later on as the Model 241. That was its, its successor. So from 1914 to 1922 was Belgium. And again, a lot of that period was really wartime, so they might have only made them in 14 and 15, something like that, or maybe only in 14. And then from 1922 to 1935, they were the Model 24 from Remington. From 1935 to 1951, they were the Model 241. Take a big deep breath. In 1956, they were made again by FN with, under the Browning name. Um, that was in 1956. They were called the Auto 22. And uh, they made that all the way up in, in, F, in by FN in Belgium all the way till 1974 where they moved production to Morocco. I think Browning, the company Browning, moved everything in 1974 to Morocco and Japan, actually. Everything from their BLRs to the BL-22s, everything. So um, it has an almost 60-year history as the Auto 22. But this is not quite its inception because... There was a Belgian-made one first, but this is the original Model 24. This one was manufactured in 1930. It's a 22 long rifle only. It takes 10 rounds capacity. Um, these were a takedown model, 19-inch barrel, two and three-quarter pounds. And uh, yeah, what else we got here? You know, these were. These are pretty cool. Let's get into some of the um, some of the looks here. It was um, here's the uh, printing on it and the scrolling. There's the Remington and uh, it's interesting. See, it's a smokeless greased twenty-two long rifle only. Smokeless greased. They wanted to make sure you were using only smokeless in here. And the grease thing had something to do with that. The bullets were coated. But it uh, couldn't have mat mattered that much because this thing functions just fine with non-greased ammo. Actually, you're not even really sure. You take out CCI, there is kind of like a weird waxy type stuff on the, on the rounds, maybe. That does function similarly as to some kind of grease. 
Uh, there's two screws back here. You see that you could remove for a tang site. If you have the uh, $7,000 it would take to buy one of those Lyman sites now. Or a marble site. God, those things are expensive. I just recently... I just recently went and picked this up on eBay. Right? It's nice. And it says 42. I thought it was going to be for... For this guy, you remember him, my uh, Remington Model 57. And uh, there's a tang site that goes on here. And after doing the video, I was like, you know what? Why not uh, secure this tang site? There's the two screw holes. But uh, after buying this thing for uh, 80 bucks, I see that it's not really the Model 42 that I was looking for. I'm not even going to unwrap it, but it's not the 42. It's 42W is what I needed. I needed a double because it says right on here, Swedish Mauser. I wish I would have known that. This guy that did the auction definitely did not. He definitely did not put uh, that it was for a Swedish Mauser in the auction body. So, but whatever. It's always nice to have things like that knocking around. You could trade that one day for somebody for, for God knows what. But uh, I think I overpaid. Anyway, I digress. Let's get into how this thing functions. It uh, obviously has no, excuse me, loading port on the side, top, or the other side. Everything happens right here. That's nice. That That's the only spot. I need, to, I need a sip of coffee. I'm sorry. Need a break there. It's the only spot that any dirt would be able to get into this thing. And it seals pretty damn well. Good job. Definitely a good job. Browning really spent a lot of time on this guy. And with a lot of the stuff with Winchester, it was a lot of like, hurry up, hurry up, rush, rush, rush kind of thing. It was always like, if you get it done by this much time, I'll give you this much. And if you get it done by that much time, I'll give you that. Well, you know, if you had time with this. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not even showing you. I'm, I'm throwing these snap caps in here. It has a very similar twist and remove... Look, this is weird, though. When I first took this out, I was like, oh, my God, I broke it. I broke it. <laughs> I thought the follower was popped out of here or something and was lost and the spring was hanging out. But this is normal. <laughs> I remember I was so distressed for, like, why then I watched, like, a takedown video of it. And I was like, wait a minute. That guy's is broken, too. No, it's not broken. It's just the way it goes. And, uh... Look, there's no drama here. You know, with some of these other guns, I was able to show you how the lifter lifts it up and how it loads. This is like, it's just, you pull back, there's the round, and you see when you're letting go, it's going to pick that up. See how it's picking that up? Boom. Picks it up. Now, if I try to cycle it upside down, the round is just going to fall back into the receiver because it has to, it, it gets kind of violently ejected, and then it would, if you turn this upside down and fired, the brass would probably hit you right in the face. It would pop right out, but... I can't really generate enough oomph with my finger to make it come out that way. But you see, here's the cycling of it. I mean, it doesn't get much more boring than that, doing it by hand. But uh, trust me, um, it functions flawlessly. It uh, drops the brass. It actually comes out forward and ahead so it doesn't land on your feet if you're wearing sandals. <laughs> and it kind of shoots it out in front of you. So um, it... Uh, very very reliable this design and like browning was cool you know the, remember we were talking about how the um the 1911 the remington 1911 like the the original semi-auto shotgun design that went to belgium he um he patented the bolt handle and a lot of that was the the head of winchester encouraged him to patent all these little things and then as he was designing that shotgun um, the head of Winchester was, uh, you know, was coaching him to patent everything. And then when he walked away with that shotgun and went to Belgium with it, it kind of hurt the guy at Winchester because now all those things, all those ideas were patented, all those little things. So things as simple as like the bolt handle on the side were patented. So when they came up with their own shotgun, it couldn't have a bolt handle. So they ha you had to like grab the barrel and he tried to do something similar. They tried to copy it with the barrel that reciprocated uh, in you know into the receiver and pushed the bolt back you tried to copy it but you couldn't have a bolt handle so you had to just grab the barrel to do it 
So it was like as if it was like some kind of detriment to them having to put it together was that they had to use a bolt handle. Look at Browning's ingenious design was, I guess you could consider that a bolt handle because it is a little nub that's on the bolt that allows you to control it. But it doesn't have like a, you know, a side ejection port with a, where you had to worry and then they had to put a plunger up here like, like Winchester did. Just how simple is that? It's the simplest. I wonder if this would have broken, would have infringed on Browning's original patent for the bolt for the 1911, for the semi-auto shotgun. I wonder if Winchester would have come out with something like this. Maybe not. Maybe that's why Remington was like, yeah, it was such a problem for you. How about that? Derp. I mean, what a simple design, but it's, you know, this function. Yeah, let me tell you, I can't take this thing apart. I want to show you. I'll take it apart and even show you how the bolt moves in here or whatever. It's very simple. And listen, I hate to just pass the buck because you'd be like, of course I could watch other YouTube videos and never have to watch yours. But there are a lot of videos that show this thing being taken apart. A guy that shows how this thing right here is adjusted. There's a really cool video from some young gentleman on uh, on this rifle. Like the only video breaking down a Model 24 I saw was some young kid, you know, and he was pretty cool. He was doing his thing. Uh, it seemed pretty knowledgeable, you know. But um, there's a lot of information out there on this thing. So I got to explain to you why I can't take this apart. Um, I always love all my stuff to be functional. But there's a thing about this, well, the way this connects right here. It's kind of like a ratcheting design. And it wasn't necessarily perfected when the Model 24 came out. Later on, they made this much better where this kind of ratcheted and it and it turned. This is supposed to ratchet. That's why it has these, this, uh, you know, it does have these ridges here. But the piece inside that's supposed to ratchet doesn't quite come in contact with these ridges properly. And trust me when I tell you it cost, it would take a lot to start modifying it to replace things. And it's just better to just, you have to work with it for a while to put it together where it's not too tight that it's not too loose it's very hard you got to keep using these tiny tiny little increment increments of adjustment and every time that you you have to lock you know adjust it lock it down and then you have to put the pieces together here and see how they fit and it took a real long time before i got it it was like oh that's too tight messed with it oh that's too loose it took a while before it just went together where i was like perfect and then i locked it down flip this switch boom and then that's it I, I never want to take it apart again because it's just so perfect it's it's not loose it's not too tight it's mint and uh when i bought it it was loose but i knew i would be able to i always knew i would be able to tighten this up properly and um if i take this apart just to show you um it's not really going to be that big of a deal and then who knows if i'll ever get it together exactly perfect again so if you get one of these, you'll see what I'm talking about. And you ain't going to want to take yours apart either. But if you did take it apart, it's kind of cool that both of these pieces are about the same length. So it stores in like a bag nicely for carrying around. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you really wanted to just take it apart and put it back together every day, you'd be able to. It's just that uh, maybe I'm just a little neurotic with these kinds of things. I like everything to be perfect. And once I got this together perfect... Um, I don't know. I just always want it to be together like this, I guess. I should just take it apart, right? No. <laughs> All right, so so here's the thing. Uh, where were we? Taking it apart. <laughs> oh, it's ambidextrous, of course, because, uh, you know, it ejects out the bottom like that and has no ejection on the side. Guns like this are really cool. You know, Browning must have been a lefty, if you think about it. Because so many of his designs were lefty compatible you know like the remember the uh the 1890 that ejects out the top right huh interesting i wonder if browning was a lefty we find to take that to check that out so they made this thing in short versions and long rifle versions right from the get-go but they stopped the short chambering uh in 1983 it was discontinued in 1983 you know when they were long with morocco already um, I guess they decided to uh, simplify things. Maybe nobody was buying the short version, you know what I mean? Um, they say high-velocity ammo was okay in these things because it was made for the stronger ammo. 
However, stick to standard velocity CCI. Trust me when I tell you. Um, it takes 10. The capacity is 10 long rifle. Or if you have the short version, it's 15. Um, this takedown uses the interrupted thread system. And uh, that's about it. That's all I got for my paperwork. So uh, what else? Oh, one interesting thing. I'll show you something cool with this thing. I'll show you how. See, if you do some research, you'll see the taking apart and putting back together thing, it was a little bit of a pain in the ass. It does come apart very easy, but um, uh, it's, um, it's finicky, right? And what would happen is, like I was saying, if you... If you really wanted it to, be to, it to be together snug, where it wasn't loose at all, typically it would be going together too snug. And then what would happen is you would have to twist this way, like that, to get it together. That way, the two pieces, right? So what people do would do is they would grab it here, they would grab it here, and they would twist really hard because, like I said, if you wanted to get it snug, it had to be really tight. And I didn't want it to put it together that tight. So I had to just keep messing with it till it was tight, but not too tight. But it's hard for it not to be too tight. And if you were twisting really hard this way to get that in, snap right here. See that piece of wood that's missing right out of there? Go look on Gunbroker for these things for sale. Every single one will either have a crack here or a piece missing from here. I promise you. Like, everybody did it. The way to really do this is to grab the receiver and grab here. That's the the meeting point right there. And you twist it together like this from here, holding the meat. But everybody did it from here and snapped off a piece of the stock right here. I swear to God, I didn't do this. <laughs> I know you think I did it. Look how worn that is. It's been like this for years. But... Um, it just goes to show that uh, that was a little bit of a weird point. I mean, it works, and it is adjustable, and it accounts for wear. That's what was cool about it, is that there's some other guns. You might say, like, well, the Winchester 1903, that went that took went apart and went together much easier, but I don't know if it does as well as accounting for wear. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, mine is fine. It, it goes back together perfectly, but... Supposedly, this was an innovative design in that it accounted for wear, that as the gun would wear, you would be able to keep adjusting it tighter, tighter, tighter if need be, where the other rifles wouldn't do that. It was just set at one point, and if it got too loose, it was too loose, and it was time to throw it away. And that this one would, you would constantly be able to adjust this ring to make it tighter and tighter. Just unfortunately, the adjustment process was not the easiest thing in the world. So, uh, yep. Well, that's it. What do we got back here? We got a, we got a nice Remington, uh, nice Remington symbol back here. Let's get some, some light on there. Can we see that? The UMC symbol back there. And, uh, look at this wood. Look at the tiger striping on that. Can you see that? It's gorgeous. This wood is absolutely gorgeous. When you catch this in the right light, it's sick. It's absolutely sick. And, uh, yep. I love this guy. The Remington Model 24 that was uh, waiting because it's one of my favorites. And up next is another one of my favorites. And uh, we'll get to that one soon. I don't know. I want to post that one real quick. I'll probably do that this weekend. But, uh, whew, what a beauty this is. Just, it's so sleek. It's just, it's just such a sleek, ergonomic design. It feels so good to put, to bring it up to your eye. And looking down those sights is just, it just, it's, it's just as comfortable as it sits on your shoulder and you put your cheek against it. You're looking right down the sights perfectly. That's how you know. Look at how the size of this thing. It's tiny. And for a big guy like me, I'm 6'3". And this thing goes right up to my shoulder, and I'm looking right down the sights. And a Boy Scout will pick it up and do the same thing. So, like, figuring out how to design the size and the shape of something to be like that, it's, it can't be easy. John Browning, look. Check this out. 
Here's a picture of him with it. He loved this freaking thing. He loved this rifle. Look at his face. That's as close to a smile as you're going to see John Brown and get. And he's holding his Model 24. Yep. You got to love him. John, this video is for you. I actually know the next video was going to be for John Browning. <laughs> no, it isn't. I still have a couple of these 22s here for you. I'm still rocking and rolling with these things. What do we got left? I'm looking behind me here. Oh, we got some. We got some work to do. We really do. I'm going to do uh, this weekend. I'm going to be back with the next one. And then maybe I'll give you guys a break after that. Maybe after that, we'll work back into this Browning timeline and we'll... Uh, We'll offer something that makes a little bit of a bigger bang and a louder noise. You've been patient. And uh, maybe you deserve to uh, maybe you deserve to have a little treat. Looking at something a little a little crazy. Maybe we'll get a little crazy. But uh, this weekend we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do another twenty two. This one I can't wait for. This is if this one is my fa is 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 the best twenty two auto loader that I know of next up is going to be my favorite single shot how's that that's what we'll say next up is my favorite single shot 22 I should just throw it right on the table and just do the video right now now one at a time can't spoil you guys thanks for tuning in uh, I'm I'm really I'm impressed and happy with the amount of viewership, even though it's um, it's not what a successful YouTube channel would consider uh, successful. But uh, for me, it's right where I want to be. I just want that nice core audience. I like when I see like all the videos have about the same amount of views. That means that I have loyal viewers, and I'd rather have a hundred loyal viewers than ten thousand. Uh, guys that watch for two minutes or, or you know what i mean or they're spotty and they don't really pay attention i like to one video would have information that uh connects to another video where am i going with this listen this was a tough rifle to make a video on i just want you to know this is my fifth attempt i've made five half hour videos on this gun and uh, four of them I decided not to. This is the fifth. And I'm going to sit and rewatch this. You know what? The thing is, just don't rewatch it. I rewatch it. And then I'm like, oh, you, this, that's, that's stupid. You forgot this. You forgot that. You said this wrong. You called this a model this when it's really a number that. Uh, I'm just not going to watch it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get off. I'm going to sit down. And I'm just going to post this. And that's it. I got to get off this Model 24. Five videos. This is the fifth one. All right, guys, you guys are great. Uh, any questions about this guy, feel free to ask. And uh, if anything you know about this that I've neglected to uh, say or forgot to say or don't know anything about, please enlighten us all. Um, I like the uh, comments version on YouTube. I never delete a comment. I never uh, modify anything, edit anything. I would never turn off comments. The comments, I think, is the greatest part. Um, I like to see other videos when after I watch the video, I get a lot of, uh, enjoyment out of looking down at the comments and seeing, um, sometimes you learn more from the comments of other people talking about stuff than you even, that you learn from the video. The video sometimes stimulates the interest in the conversation and then it's in the comments where the real knowledgeable people come in and, um, and, and give the right answers and link to other things and, really start the learning process for everyone you know what i mean so uh that's what this is about community effort you know what i mean all righty that was a whole lot of talking and very little rifle i think wasn't it i'm gonna have to do this video over again no i'm not gonna do it over again did i mention it has a cross bolt safety see now i, I gotta do the video again because i forgot about the cross bolt safety how's that gonna fit in it's wild. Watch the videos of it coming apart. When it comes apart, then uh, this part, you see how this is starting to, it moves a little. This whole thing is spring-loaded, and you push it out, and then that little button right there, you see that little button? That little button right there, you press it, and it, that's what removes the bolt. Comes apart very simply. Perfect for like a Boy Scout. Hence the Boy Scout rifle. Look at that front sight. Look at how tall that is. See, that's why it just, 
even for a tall guy like me, when I put this thing to my shoulder, look at that crown. Gorgeous, this thing. I love it. Model 24. Guys, I'll see you in a day or so for my favorite single shot. Stay tuned. Later.